Thank you very much for the invitation first. Um, and welcome to this afternoon session after lunch. So maybe you'll get some an hour and a half rest to hear me for 10, 12 minutes here. And what I'll, I'll try to explain here and give a bit more context and examples for you also to better understand how you can work on energy poverty at multiple scales. So I'll give a couple of examples at the Portuguese level, what we have been, been doing in Portugal, uh, connecting with climate change, connecting with uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation, energy poverty assessment, supporting the government. So uh, a couple of, of ideas here. But I would like to start with, we talked about the, the Ruby Cube, and now I'm talking about chess. So tackling energy poverty and addressing energy poverty is like playing chess. In fact, I could broader this to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Why? Because we need to consider all the pieces of the puzzle. So we have people here from municipalities, from NGOs, from alliances, from universities. So we need all the pieces of the puzzle as well for energy poverty mitigation, and we need to address multiple strategy. We have here things about bottom-up funding and support, or technical uh, assistance, or funding at the national scales. But unlike chess, this is a collaborative game. We need all of us together to reach out the objectives of energy poverty mitigation, as well, in fact, on climate change and carbon neutrality, for example. So that said, uh, and as the, the, our host here uh, uh, mentioned, this is a b really big problem. So I would say that well over 30 million Europeans have problems of energy poverty in some kind of, of, of uh, reason. So either in the summer or winter, or uh, delays in paying their energy bills, or living in houses with problems of structural problems of energy efficiency, humidity, and mold. So this is super um, hot topic as well, but it's, not, uh, it's been running for a long, a long time um, in different countries. So it clearly affects the most vulnerable people, specifically people uh, that disabled, uh, children, um, elderly, uh, migrants. So a lot of uh, citizens are impacted, but uh, we have vulnerable consumers in different locations. So as Miguel in the previous session mentioned, we need this multi-governance uh, level to trying to support energy poverty. As an example to, for you to understand the diversity of the issue, and I highlight here Portugal on the left, you can see on choosing the inability to keep the house adequately warm, we have a big problem. So in most indicators, Portugal have a big problem. It's pretty, it's far from you here, but it's pretty similar consumption patterns with fireplaces, problems on energy efficiency of homes. So it's pretty similar. You can think about your own countries around this area and Portugal is quite, quite the same. But then if you look on the right on areas on utility bills, we don't have a problem. So the, and I can, I can delve into that maybe on the next coffee break, not now, but just to show you the importance of choosing a, a, a multi-variety of indicators, not only choosing one, because that can be political managed. If I choose the one on the left, we have a problem. The one on the right, nobody talks about the issue. Um, then we have multiple indicators we have been also fostering. I'm also part of the EU Energy Poverty Advisory Hub uh, that Dora mentioned. So we have been working on indicators trying to provide assistance at different scales and trying to range uh, information and providing detailed knowledge on this. Um, but then we are working closely in Portugal to trying to uh, address the problem. So I'm coming from a research center and university, but we are really on the ground also supporting citizens and communities to trying to address energy poverty. And how this, how this started? This started more or less seven, eight years ago when we started building the performance of the buildings in Portugal. So we have a, uh, over 264 building typologies mapped in Portugal, trying to understand what are the vulnerability of the country in different buildings. That were able us to make, make this mapping of the energy performance of the building stock. So we have the 3,092 civil parishes, so below municipal level, Portugal mapped to thermal comfort and uh, efficiency of buildings and the energy needs of buildings, both in winter and summer. This allowed us to develop something which we call the Energy Poverty Vulnerability Index. So coming from the building side, the energy efficiency of the buildings, trying to understand four questions, I would say. So in which buildings people lived? which are more vulnerable on, on, under energy poverty, what are their en energy needs, what is their energy consumption, and what is also their socioeconomic background. So this was the driving questions for us to develop this energy poverty index where we combine socioeconomic characteristics of the population in different regions with the building's energy efficiency, energy consumption, trying to bundle it together to do this assessment for heating and for cooling, so for summer and winter dual vulnerabilities. This allows us to do this comprehensive assessment and support to cities and the national level on 
on energy poverty. So we can go from the national picture, as you can see on the left, this is just mainland Portugal, and then we can zoom into specific municipalities and beyond it in civil parish level to support and to, as I call it, to find hotspots for local action. So this not allow us to say that we have 1 million, 2 million Portuguese people on energy poverty. It allow us to say where are the most vulnerable, potentially the most vulnerable regions, where we can find easily more people. So that's what we, we convey with this. But then, because this is an interrelated topic with multiple things, especially climate change, of course, energy consumption and buildings energy efficiency, we have been working together at different levels to global level, for example, with this user's TCP on the R, uh, IEA, uh, energy are to reach energy consumers at European level with the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub or other European projects, but also at the local scale. And for that, we have been not only diagnosing the problem and looking for the problem in diff different areas and different uh, drivers, let's say, but also trying to find solutions. So recently we made some work and published two, two, two these research papers on uh, the costs for Portugal, for Portuguese entities, on retrofitting the whole household level. So we are talking about 72,000 million euros. And the recovery and resilience plan money for energy efficiency is 300 million euros. It's less than 2%. Uh, and you see here the scale of the issue. And this is more or less the same scale, I would say, to any country, more or less percentage. But that's the money we are putting. We are saying we are doing a lot. Compared to the past, probably it's a lot, but it's still too far from the ambitions we have for climate, we have for buildings, we have for integration of renewable energy. And then, because we have, we, I've been trying to build with my team this idea of, OK, we have the diagnosis. We know the problem. But where are the solutions? How much would it would cost? How can we support the citizens? And for that, we have developed also this digital energy efficiency one-stop shop. It's called the Green Menu, uh, where we have several hundreds of measures of energy efficiency at different, different end uses in homes for people to reach out and see what they can do. We have a building typology there. We have links to regulation, to funding schemes for people to know a bit more. But because we, uh, I knew this was not enough and clearly not reaching the most vulnerable, that's where your question, fine, but that's a digital tool. So we moved on with that and have developed uh, for the last year and a half this maritime container. We have this energy efficiency one-stop shop. We bought a container, a shipping container, we renovated it and we are using the, it as an um, energy efficiency support uh, location for citizens. So we go, we move around. So we have been in five different locations already. We stay more or less three months in each of the locations to get support to the most vulnerable. Lots of traps there, lots of problems as well. We can delve uh, after, but it's something we are trying to build. Getting closer and closer from the EU level, the European Commission support to the citizen in Portugal in a, a rural uh, area. And that's because uh, we are, I would say, during the years, well connected with different areas in the country. So we are able to support both municipal level and the country level. So we have been integrating our knowledge, for example, on climate change adaptation strategies. People will talk about that later. So we are able to map different areas to the vulnerability to climate change scenarios. So not only the current vulnerability, but uh, in, in, in encompassing the uh, expected increase in heat uh, or what's the vulnerability in the summer and winter for different climate change scenarios. These are two different regions in Portugal. Then uh, we have been also supporting, uh, for example, Lisbon, our, our knowledge on energy poverty within the city of Lisbon has, has been part of the housing chart of Lisbon and the climate plan of Lisbon. So we have our energy poverty mapping and vulnerability in those climate plans. So it's not only about energy poverty in a separate document, it's also integrating that knowledge under climate change plans, for example. Another example is this impact on the media. Not only about our research, these examples are connected to our research, for example, our index, that then journalists pick up and go to the different locations asking what's the situation, and we can see this example. So this, this on the... Um, on the left, that it's squared in green, it says the most vulnerable location we mapped in our index. And I can tell you that our index is updated annually with the information we have. So of course the top changes a bit, but of course the, the I would say the first 100 are always vulnerable. It doesn't matter if they are the 98th place or 15th place, there is a high level of vulnerability on those regions. But then we can also able, that, that's the message here on, on the media part, we can also able, um, other development, other types of work at the different levels. So we kind of do red alert signals. 
On this case, we pointed to this location. We could, as I said, we can point for the first 100 would be a sim similar problem. And then we got journalists going to find people and we got really trouble um, stories. For example, we can see here, and I translate it to English, I have the fire always on, I only open the windows when I cannot breathe anymore. Or another example, a lot of elderly people save on medicine to buy wood, since they do not have the strength to get it in the woods anymore. So these are kind of situations you might hear in Hungary, in Poland, in different uh, Eastern countries as well, but it's highlighting the issue and giving, going beyond statistics going to the lived experience of people to get that, that for the public policy as well. It's not about numbers, not about two million Portuguese people. It's about their stories as well, which we try to bring. And that's, that's it on my side, was, was fast. Uh, but uh, now I have more time for questions because it was a lot of information. Thank you very much.